Thank you very much, sir. My name is Abhijit. I'm a, I'm a physicist and I'm also a YouTuber these days. So uh, when we think of media, we typically think of the entertainment industry and the, and the news industry. But media has taken lots of forms over the millennia. It's been rock carvings, it's been uh, newspapers, it's been libraries, and much more. Now, an interesting transformation happened in the 18th and 19th centuries when the first newspapers came out. So before that, whatever information was stored, encoded in the media was the most valuable and important information that a society would have. That's what was transmitted in various forms of media. In the 19th century onwards, you had newspapers because apparently people needed to know what's happening all across the world. And you had things like uh, pulp fiction, entertainment in, in the form of writing and so on. So things changed in the 19th century onwards. Uh, the information that was being transmitted became less important, less valuable in the long term, but it became scalable, it became monetizable. So media became a big business. You could make millions, billions, trillions of dollars if you had a media company. And eventually, obviously, we had the, uh, the advent of radio, of gramophone records, of movies, of television, and much more. That's the 20th century landscape. So that is what we now call legacy media. And because of this a widespread nature of media, it became a very influential thing. Politicians understood it immediately. So media essentially became an influence operation. Hollywood is an influence operation. It's an American influence operation. Uh, the USSR won, uh, defeated the Nazis in continental Europe, but we all think it's the Americans who did it because they saved Private Ryan. So that's the kind of influence media has, entertainment has, and so does uh, the news industry as well. Now, in the 21st century, things have changed. Obviously, from the 90s, uh, 90s onwards, the internet became a thing. Initially, we had web 1.0, uh, flat HTML and CSS, uh, uh, static websites. Then you had uh, the advent of uh, Google search. Then you had uh, YouTube. And then you had interactive uh, websites. So the users, end users, became the content creators. That's what started happening. And that's how a lot of metadata was generated, which is all now being used, mined by the big data companies. They have uh, been doing this for the past 20 years. And today, the media landscape is very different. We are entering the meta era in 2022. So a handful of very large monopolistic American companies have decided to transform the world. And that's where we are at today. Now, who is the target of this? I mean, we can unpack this in great detail, but they are laser focused on the next generation, on generation Z and generation alpha, which is essentially the kids of today, the children, the teenagers, 15 years old, 13 year old kids, even the eight to 10 year olds and even the toddlers. That's, what, that's whom they are investing in. It's a huge investment they're making. And there are certain characteristics that all of these kids have in common. Firstly, they were all born in an era where you have 24 by seven access to good internet. Secondly, they all have access since birth to uh, smart devices. And thirdly, they all have been exposed since their birth to streaming services. So that's the kind of world they have been born in it's the kind of world we would not have imagined when we were born, when we were growing up. So it, they are living, essentially, these kids in a whole different universe, which is very different from ours. Their entire brains and everything is wired differently. And that is the target. That is the demographic that the meta era is targeting. And that is what they're going to monetize. So it is a big challenge. There is no concept of national sovereignty in the meta era. And, and that brings up a whole lot of challenges. They talk about, I mean, it is a challenge. They talk about inclusivity, diversity, etc. But as we know on social media, where is the diversity of opinions? Opinions are supposed to be one dimensional and, and monochromatic. Even Indian government officials, sitting members of parliament, etc., have been targeted, bullied. They've been forced to take down posts. So there is no diversity of opinions that is allowed on the internet. And the, the reason for this is that all of these companies come from one country, the United States, and they will obviously uh, propagate a certain point of view. The world is a beautiful place because of diversity and locality, localism. If you go to the to various countries, you will find very beautiful manifestations of local culture, lifestyle, all that. But if you have a monochromatic, monocultural world, it's going to make the world a very boring and dull and drab and lifeless place. But that's the, the threat 
that we will face when uh, a single entity essentially, the metaverse takes over the whole world. So that is one of the threats that we will be facing and of, of course it's going to be a threat for every individual country's culture, way of life and much more. So if they target the youngsters, see, see they will sell it to us in a different way. They will tell us that uh, you can wear these wonderful VR headsets and you can sit in your bedroom and interact with people a thousand miles away as if you're in the same office. That's wonderful. They'll tell you that your kids can learn so quickly and absorb so much information very fast. Wonderful. So that's how they are selling it to us. But the, the actual uh, intent is to monetize the youngsters, it's to hook them into it. They have been iteratively improving upon the algorithms of how to constantly trigger the dopamine center of the brain so that kids get hooked to it. And you know, uh, if, you, if you look at the lives of kids today, they are hooked on games like, uh, on platforms like Roblox and, uh, and Minecraft and various other games, GTA, etc. So these people have iteratively improved the algorithms and, the, and, and that's how they're able to hook kids into it. So the hope essentially is that the new generations, Generation Z, Generation Alpha and, and on, onwards, will be totally hooked to the metaverse. And the question we have to ask ourselves is what problem is the metaverse solving? What real world problem is it solving? Is it solving world hunger? Is it solving uh, climate change? Is it solving cancer? Is it finding us a new vaccine for dengue, which nobody has ever found? It's not solving any big problems. It's, it's trying to addict us, hook us into a certain lifestyle. And the fact is that with great power comes great power and no responsibility. The only responsibility these big corporations have is to their shareholders firstly, and secondly to their governments. Or, or vice versa, whichever way it works. They have no responsibility to the end user beyond what is contained in the big wall of legal text. So there is no responsibility and they, their only intention is to make money and profit their shareholders and also serve as geopolitical agents of influence for the government. The Indian national interest does not figure in this, neither does the French national interest or any other national interest. So this is a big challenge going forward for every country which still has an independent foreign policy. And the solution to that is oversight and regulation. So that's what I can say about this. I'll keep it brief. I will hand the baton back to Sir.